Okay, so welcome to the IPSEC workshop. This is our program for today. So first, I will give a short IPSEC status update, so what's happened since last time we met at NetApp. And then it used to be an IPSEC configuration tutorial, but unfortunately we have to skip this due to technical problems. So we go ahead then and do the IPSEC crypto offload for network devices talk. And after that we have a presentation about the IPSEC flow cache removal. And after that, Hannes jumped in and wants to present a to-do list on IPSEC, what can be done for the next time. So let's start with a status update. So last time on that stuff, we had a discussion on how to avoid the copy on writes in the IPSEC data path. So the problem here is that most of the ESP data frames are linearized because we need writable buffers for the crypto operations. So in, in between we solved that. It is on the TX part we use separate source and destination buffers for the crypto. crypto. So an extra copy is not needed anymore there. On the RX side, we did it a little bit different. So we linearize only if the buffer is really not writable. So with these two changes, we fixed this in the networking layer. But unfortunately, a new problem appeared because some crypto alg algorithms just linearize if we do not pass a linear buffer, which is kind of unfortunate tune because in particular, because GCM, ANS, and I does this. But I learned this week that I'm not the only one who has this problem. The KTLS people have the problem too, and also I learned that there is already a better implementation of that, but it's just not with the Linux kernel. So in case we can get that in the Linux kernel, we would have get rid of the copy and write problem entirely. So, so far on the copy and write, Next thing is the thing that I call the fractal pointer splitting for GSO buffers. This feature was already on the slides of Alexander Dyke's talk yesterday. So I'm rushing a bit over this. So the general thing is GRO can build buffers with a frag list. And the problem, this leads to a general forwarding problem because we cannot offload so, such buffers to hardware. They have to be linearized fully in the stack. And this problem was solved recently. We just split these buffers at a flat frackless pointer into TSO offloadable buffers. And yes, as I said, fixed recently, and it's mainline with the next kernel version. So we are done here. Next thing we had last time is we wanted to add a GRO code path for IPsec. So all we have to do here is just we have to add the GRO handlers for the IPsec protocols. But so we had a small problem to get discussed last time because if we do that, we don't see the IPsec packets in the stack anymore and we were not sure if everybody is happy with that. So the question appeared if this should be configurable somehow aside from just disabling GRO completely. And so by now we've solved that by doing IPsec offloading as a config option, so the user can choose if he wants to have this IPsec offloading, and if he chooses to do so, so he's probably aware that he won't see these packets anymore. So I think we are good here too. Next thing we had last time is going to the GX path. We wanted to do something for GSO2, and what we wanted to do, to do here is we wanted to move the GSO handling from the transforms layer more to the network card to the generic GSO layer at layer two. Unfortunately, we faced some bigger problems there. So this kind of works kind of good if we can offload the crypto operations to a network card but unfortunately it does not work so well if we are doing software crypto. And the reason for that is that in software crypto, the crypto operations can return asynchronous and we have really problems to handle this in the GSO layer. We tried it and I faced all sorts of problems. So I have no idea how to do this currently. So this is deferred until we have a solution for that. Okay, that's the status for the GSO. Going further, what about scalability? 
problem here is that we need for each packet several locks to do the state and the policy lookups. And apparently this doesn't scale well with multiple parallel flows. This problem was solved recently. We just converted the packet path to RCU. This work was done by Florian Westphal and it's going to be mainline with the next kernel version. So what do we get from that? Let's see some performance numbers. So I did tunnel mode forwarding tests. I used GCM, AESNI with IPv4 and GCP. My setup was the following. I used two IPsec gateways which with 72 cores each and 16 10 gbit NICs. As a traffic generator, I used the Spiron test center and with this Test setup, I measured a baseline back in April with 3.8 gbit per second for a single flow. So let's see where we get now. Currently with uh, recent and next and the RFC patches I've posted recently, we've got for a single flow 5.7 gbit per second, which is an improvement from almost 2 gbit, which is quite nice, I think. And also, I think we are not completely done here. The packet part is still not completely optimized. I think with a little bit of work, we can get out more there. So let's go ahead and see what happens for multi-flow. So again, with next, 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 the RFC patches and receive side scaling with 16 B-direction flows, I've got 155 gbit per second for IPsec, which is quite impressive, I think. I mean, I want to mention, so the theoretical limit of the setup is 160 gbit per second, so we are almost there. I think the rest we lack here is particle overhead for IPsec. So if you have more network cuts, this can do better properly, yes? How much of the machine Not everything, maybe the half. Yeah, I think I used 32, 32 cores. I mean, there's still, if, if you have more network cards, you can do better. Or if you use... What's the packet size? It's big packet size, M2 size. So, 1,500? Yes, right. So, after that, last time we thought about, what about getting IPsec into hardware? And from that, we did a lot the last half year. So we implemented an IPsec hardware offloading API. And then the Mellanox LMX5 driver was converted to use that API. And we've got finally all these works on a Mellanox Connect X4. So I don't want to go in detail here because Boris will tell more about that in a minute. So this means we currently have one user for this offloading API, but we are probably get one more because Intel is recently working to get IPsec offload for the Niantix next to work, which have support in hardware for IPsec 2. So that's the status update. That's all I want to say. Next one is Boris. Okay, uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, we actually started this work at uh, NetDev 1.1, where we saw the IPsec performance problems, and we had this idea for crypto offload, and this is how this work began. Uh, so this presentation is about crypto offload for IPsec to network devices. Uh, so we'll start with some motivation and the model, which is somewhat similar to TLS. Uh, after that, we'll discuss all the challenges that we have for IPsec uh, and the unique parts uh, of the stack that benefited and had also unique problems related to IPsec and crypto offload. Uh, then we'll discuss some performance results using uh, this crypto offload, uh, the current status, limitations of this approach, 
uh, future work, uh, and uh, that's about it. So uh, for motivation, we have uh, similarly to what we, pre what we presented with TLS, uh, there is an existing memory model for crypto flow today with the PCI, when you go three times and it's not uh, as good, you also get uh, extra latency from going over the PCI. Uh, so this is not a very good model for uh, packet processing. Um, also, it is not possible to do LSO or checksum offloads when you use uh, anything other than a NIC that supports crypto. So that's a big performance loss, and we're going to show that during the presentation. Um, so the software model for this approach is one where the software is responsible for all packet processing. Uh, this includes all framing of the packet according to all protocols. Uh, the IPsec protocol entirely, the replay protection, the policies, uh, everything except encryption, basically, where the NIC is responsible for encrypting, decrypting, and authenticating packets uh, that go through the device, uh, while uh, packets that fail authentication, uh, they remain unmodified, so if software decides to do something else about those, uh, it is still possible. Uh, generally, all of this API follows a uh, main principle of software fallback, where Hardware might not encrypt or decrypt something, and software handles it. And software can decide when it wants to encrypt something by itself and when it wants to offload it to hardware, if it's possible. Um, and all operations that are performed by hardware can also be performed by software. Uh, that's, that also means that uh, many times you need to have some kind of synchronization. So uh, software and hardware don't get out of sync. That doesn't mean that we need to synchronize hardware and software, it's just done implicitly. Um, so for those of you that aren't really familiar with IPsec, this is how it looks like. Uh, so we have an IP packet here on the, the right, on the left side, an IP TCP packet, and once IPsec is applied, we get an additional IP header uh, that's called tunnel mode. ESP tunnel mode, and we get an additional ESP header that includes an SPI and a sequence number, where the yellow part is the original packet and an IV, which is used by the encryption, and uh, all of the yellow part is encrypted and authenticated. Also notice that there is a trailer here that also belongs to the IPsec protocol, which includes padding, padding length, and the protocol here inside, which is IP for tunnel mode, and uh, the authentication data at the end. And all of this thing is authenticated. Uh, so the yellow part is encrypted and all of the uh, payload is authenticated. So let's begin with our challenges. So the first challenge uh, is LSO. So as I've mentioned earlier, it is not possible to do LSO without crypto offload to the NIC. Uh, and let's see why. So there are a few requirements to perform LSO. The first is checksum offload. Uh, for any segmentation that is performed, uh, checksum has to be done for any segment that is created. And uh, as we saw in the previous slide, all of the TCP header part is encrypted. So if it's already encrypted, it is impossible by hardware to do uh, the checksum. Uh, also, we need to generate the IPsec trailer because the software, when it does GSO, it doesn't have any method uh, of adding trailers to each and every one of the segments, and the trailer has to be unique for every segment, so it's not the same one for all of them. Um, and finally, we need to use the correct IV for each packet, uh, since for protocols like ASGCM, the IV has to be unique, and we can't just copy the IV for each and every one of the segments, and that would break the encryption. So the IV needs to be incremented as well. Um, also, the ESP sequence number has to be incremented, so that's also unusual. Uh, and of course, the TCP sequence numbers need to be incremented as well. So if we look at it schematically, we see that we need to touch three places in the packet, and all of them are encrypted. 
the IV needs to be updated for each GSO segment, the TCP uh, checksum needs to be updated, and the trailer needs to be, needs to be generated and populated by hardware. Uh, so those are the challenges for LSO implementation. Uh, the next uh, challenging thing is checksum offload. So uh, without crypto offload, it is impossible. And with crypto offload, it becomes possible. However, there are a few problems. So the problem we had here is that uh, the IPsec packet uh, has a trailer. And uh, currently, both our hardware and the API uh, define that uh, checksum partial uh, it works from a certain offset up to the end of the packet. However, in IPsec packets, we have a trailer which should not be included in the TCP checksum, and uh, that, uh, that's a problem for uh, our device and uh, generally for passing packets uh, to the device driver where you have a trailer and you expect checksum offload. So we thought of two possible solutions for this problem. Uh, the first one is that when IPsec packets are uh, offloaded, uh, their encryption is offloaded, we'll send those packets without a trailer, and it would be generated by hardware similarly to the way we do it with uh, LSO, where it is necessary and unavoidable, or in a different solution where the driver would parse the offloaded IPsec packet and remove the trailer, um, and then let hardware process it as it does. Um, so that's the transmit side. For the receive side, we need to offload checksum complete, where you have uh, a similar, however simpler problem, where hardware performs the checksum for the entire packet, starting from the IP. However, it includes the trailer, and it needs to be removed. Uh, so that's not as problematic as the transmit side, but it is uh, still unusual. Uh, so here it is schematically. We need to calculate the checksum before the encryption or after the encryption, uh, but we don't want to include that part in the end where we have the trailer, which is unrelated to TCP. Uh, and the last challenge we had is the IV processing or IV generation. So for LSO, we need uh, hardware to generate the IV for each packet for the IV to be unique. And uh, this is what has to be done according to the RFC. However, the RFC doesn't define how it should be done or how uniqueness should be ensured. And uh, in Linux, we have a special mechanism called SecIV that uh, uh, takes a sequence number, XORs it with a salt, uh, and then uses it as an IV. Uh, this is something that is really Linux specific, and it's not generic in any way. And since we needed to create the IV in hardware, and software might generate packets that are not encrypted by the hardware, so we have to uh, make sure that IVs don't repeat when they are generated by software and when uh, they are generated by hardware. So the way we implemented this is by implementing uh, sec IV in hardware. We basically uh, we pass the salt to the device, and the device performs this XOR operation uh, for uh, all IPsec packets that are floated. So this is how uh, we got through this. However, I'm not sure if the Intel device uh, supports such a thing or not. Uh, so this is how it looks schematically. We have to XOR this IV here using the salt uh, generated by SecIV. Um, okay, so uh, we did some performance tests for uh, this uh, offload. In the performance test, we have an IXIA packet generator here below, uh, and we send packets uh, to one machine where we perform IPsec, so the packets are TCP packets. Uh, they are being encrypted by a crypto offloading device, uh, decrypted by another crypto offloading device, and then routed back to the IXIA machine. So all the links here are 40, giga NICs, uh, 40 gigabit NICs, uh, Connectix 4, uh, the Nova product. And uh, we send 40 gigabit uh, on the transmit line, and then uh, packets get dropped because uh, the CPU can't handle much more. 
So let's see the performance results. Uh, so on the left side, we see uh, which direction are we looking at, and then the, there are two metrics, throughput and CPU. Uh, so for a single stream, we get uh, 4.5 gigabits for no offload and 25.5 for the transmit side of offload. So that's like five times more. Uh, and uh, for the CPU is obviously on 100% for this case. For the receive side, uh, we get for no offload also 4.5. However, with offload, we get a little bit less. We get 18.2 gigabits per second. Uh, so that's a little bit less. So at the end, we get only 18 gigabits, even though the transmit side could do even more. So uh, the current status of uh, this product and our efforts for the hardware and the driver that we support ESP version 4 uh, tunnel mode uh, with ASGCM. We support LSO, check some offload, and this IV processing. Uh, we have some statistics <coughs> that show what was encrypted by hardware uh, using IFTOL, and uh, we export the, the capabilities that are provided by the IPsec stack. Uh, in the IPsec stack, there's support for this API for ESP4 and 6, and there's support for G GSO and uh, the checksum offload support. And in user space, we implemented patches for IP Route 2 and for Strongs 1. Uh, Basically, a user can define which security association is going to be offloaded and which isn't. Um, so he has control at a fine granularity. Uh, from the limitation side, we cannot support any IP fragments, so those are processed in software. And the stack ensures that uh, the crypto offloading device doesn't get any of those packets, so we don't have a problem there. Uh, another limitation is that offloaded packets must be routed to the offloading device because we don't want to send the plain text through another device. Uh, and uh, that's uh, an issue for discussion. How do we overcome this problem? Can we do some software fallback there? Or uh, do we have any other solution for this problem? Um, for the future, the next thing that we are going to do is implement uh, transport mode uh, in the upcoming couple of months. Uh, then we get to IPv6, uh, ASCBC with uh, SHA-1, uh, extended sequence numbers, and there, there's an interesting issue because hardware needs to maintain the state for extended sequence numbers, so it becomes less stateful, uh, and it needs to be maintained somehow. Um, Following that, we could do some encapsulation support. Currently, we support only tunnel mode. If we want to do uh, generic encapsulation, uh, we should think how do we introduce such support. Uh, the next point is offloading replay protection. Uh, and we actually need to offload replay protection mainly because we want to do RSS using the inner headers of IPsec, uh, something which becomes possible with uh, crypto offload. We don't do it today mainly because uh, if we would have done it, then there would be a scalability issue since if uh, the exaframe state is being handled by two CPUs, then the replay protection would cause the exaframe state to bounce between those CPUs, and we wouldn't get much benefit from it. So we do use the SPI, but you want to use the inner headers. In, in the IPsec packet, you have the inner TCP ports and the IP ports. Uh, no, not all the time. The, the question was if our system, the SPI, is not strong enough, and why? Well, when you're using tunnel mode, you can have a tunnel mode, for example, between two sites, and many different users that are using this tunnel so what you get is that all those users have the same SPI, and it doesn't scale really well. We're actually facing this from um, our guys. So they want to only have IPsec for a specific TCP flow, which is defined by the service port. That means the other side is a transient port, so you don't have too much control over the SPI. It gets selected for you. So this is something I was going to ask Stefan as well. So when you, especially when you do transport mode, you kind of lose that control and it gets a little bit hairy. So it's not a trivial problem. 
You would yes. like to use the SPI, but you cannot really pick the SPI because you end up having, like if you try to define the uh, whole um, SA, DB, and SPD, you end up with four flows that you're dealing with. So and I think you're good if you have fine-grained security associations. If you have just one security association that takes everything, then you probably need to look inside because if you just have one security association, everything goes to the same CPU. Uh, if we use it, exactly the IPv6 can uh, Tom, what's in the, IP, in the IPv6 header? How, how do you call it? The flow ID. Yeah. Can, can we use that? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not familiar with the, what is possible so, yeah, to do in IPv6. 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 So the SPI is supposed to be the thing that covers both IPv4 and IPv6, right? Solving the IPv6 problem and not solving the IPv4 problem is not good enough. So. Yeah, we can just go IPv6 first, right? <laughs> well, we have, so we have no support for IPv6. That's a different problem. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's continue. We have some slides about the implementation details of this solution. So uh, we've added a new NDO called XFRM DevOps, uh, which is used to offload the SA entry to hardware. Uh, basically, there is an add operation which attempts to offload some XFRM state. Uh, it might fail if hardware doesn't support some part of the XFRM state. For example, the crypto algorithm isn't supported or the protocol isn't supported, for example, AH, or maybe there is some encapsulation being involved, or for any other reason, if you offload, it might fail and uh, software needs to handle that. Uh, then we we have the the release part when we delete the SA entry and free it. We separate it into f two functions because we don't want to free device memory while we're in atomic context. So this is why it is separate. The delete actually stops offload and free releases hardware memory. And uh, the final function uh, it is used to check that a certain packet, a certain SKB, could be uh, offloaded. Um, it is mainly useful for checking that the SKB will actually be offloaded uh, before the decision is made. And if this function returns true, then uh, the stack could rely on hardware to offload this packet. Uh, so that's for the NDOs. Uh, for the receive flow, uh, hardware identifies uh, offloaded IPsec packets according to the DSIP and the SPI, as mentioned earlier. Uh, once an offloaded packet is identified, it is being decrypted and authenticated uh, by hardware. Uh, the completion contains the information of the result uh, of the decryption operation, and if it succeeded or failed. Uh, the driver receives uh, the result. It pop populates the SecPath for the SKB, which usually uh, is done in XFRM input, uh, since hardware already knows which XFRM state was used, uh, it populates the SecPath, and as part of the SecPath which we expanded, we tell the stack what was the result of the offload operation. If crypto was done, and was it done successfully? So once we get to XFRM input, we could skip decryption and authentication, and XFRM state lookup uh, all already has been completed by a hardware and driver, uh, we only need to process the headers and to perform checks on complete, and everyone is happy. Uh, you should note that if you look at TCP dump, you see uh, ESP packets with plain text. Uh, so that might be unusual and maybe even useful for some of you. Uh, for the transmit flow, on XFRM output, we perform a check to see if XFRM offload is okay. So we check that the SKB could be offloaded. Uh, and if the answer is yes, then we could rely on the device to offload. Uh, we also populate the sec path on transmit, which is somewhat unusual because previously it was used only on the receive side. Uh, we use that to indicate for hardware that this packet is going to be offloaded. Um, also, we set the encapsulation field uh, of the SKB since if you don't encrypt, then the packet is actually a tunnel packet and it's encapsulated. It has an inner IP and inner TCP header that could be used. 
um, in exaferm output one, uh, when we get a GSO packet, uh, we only need to add the ESP header. We don't actually need to add any trailer. And as discussed earlier, uh, with LSO, we generate the trailer anyway in hardware. Uh, there's also an additional replay protection mechanism that handles GSO packets, since you need to count each and every one of the segments that are going to leave uh, the device. Um, so at the network device, we look at the SecPath of the SKB and see if uh, offload is expected. Uh, if yes, then we perform the offload, we set all the fields, and uh, if needed, we perform LSO and check some offload by leveraging the inner header pointers. Um, Finally, if we choose in the API to use uh, the trailer in all packets, we need to remove the trailer if it's required. So that's it. Any questions? Mike? Um, so a couple of things. Um, the net about IPv6 being on the future list um, has been registered. <laughs> Um, so this might be more of a general question, but I think it will relate to, to my next comment. Um, how close are we to DTLS being a drop-in replacement for IPsec um, with regards to accelerating it? So yesterday we had to talk about TLS acceleration. This is IPsec. DTLS looks to me like it's more like IPsec. How, how far do you think we are from uh, doing the same thing we just did in DTLS? That's a very good question. There are many protocols that are related to IPsec in a similar way where each packet is encrypted uh, independently of others. Other examples are MarkSec, Quick, and DTLS, as you've mentioned. Uh, for all of those, while it might seem very similar, the API will probably be a little bit different. For example, you can look at all the uh, unique quirks you have with IPsec where you need to do TSO, which, for example, you don't need to do for DTLS for any reason. Uh, so it doesn't exist over there, that this problem in the checksum offload also doesn't exist. Uh, so so um, I'm going to disagree with that, and this is a good lead into my second comment. So one of your slides, you had um, the idea that you wanted to support IPsec with VXLAN and Genev. I have no idea how you would do that. The, the problem is these, these protocols are designed for an outer IP header, an inner IP header, and then transport payload. So for instance, if you wanted to do a tunnel version of IPsec, you would actually end up having three IP headers in this packet. Once you support IPv6, that's 120 bytes of overhead and IP headers. I, I don't see how that flies. Now, the, the problem here is that neither of those protocols have really thought at all about how to do security. If they did it right, what they would do is put a DTLS inside of that. Um, DTLS is a natural fit for UDP. But then now we would have something that looks like, say, IP header, uh, UDP header, VXLAN header, and then DTLS, and then embedded packet. So the advantage of that is now we're using DTLS. But in that case, you would want the, the TSO, the LRO, and things like that. Um, that. That, in my mind, is going to be much better than IPsec, which I think is, is going to um, be a bear to try to wedge into the encapsulation protocols. Mm -hmm. They're much more amenable to DTLS. So Tom, what problem are you trying to solve? If the IPsec is between is end to end from the inner, the, from the guest to another guest, you have to do that anyway, right? So, so I, I don't want three headers in my packet. But you might not be able to do anything about that if the guest wants to have IPsec end to end with another guest. The, so we can, so, so if you so use DTLS properly, it can so be part of the Sorry to step in, but Wait, I think are, we had some other questions, and we have two more presentations, so please. Okay, we, might, we can take this offline. Discuss it later. 
So just a couple of words. I haven't considered DTLS as an encapsulation protocol, but just as another protocol as an encapsulation, it's really interesting, and you do have all those uh, LSO problems that need to be handled, and we should look into this. Uh, you mentioned the issue of the trailers. I think you have to put them in for two reasons. The first reason is the length of the SKB has to be true to what you're going to put onto the wire all the way through the stack just in case something happens, like an MTU change or an MSS event or whatever. Also, in the case of, uh, you mentioned if we, uh, the route changes and we end up uh, sending a crypto offload, IPsec offloaded packet to a non-IPsec offloading device, the fix-up code needs to have the trailer there if we decide to fix up the packet, it, which is a policy decision, we could decide to drop such packets too, right? But I'm saying that if we do decide to fix it up, we need all that information in there in the packet to do what the hardware would have done. So okay. So I think the most important aspect is that the length has to be exactly what's going to end up on the wire after you do your, your IPsec mm -hmm. offload. I think this is not really possible if you have GSO packets because how you. I mean, for the non the at least for the non GSO yes, case, I want the trailer should be yes, there. Yes, we have the trailer for the non GSO case, but exactly not for the GSO case. But for the GSO case, it's yeah, GSO packets are different. Yeah. Right, but for the non GSO case, I think you have to absolutely have the trailer there. That's what we currently do. Okay, then that's fine. So you, your question, what in that slide was, what to do in the GRO case? No, no. I wanted to make sure that we are on the same page, so I put it like yes. neutrally. Yes, so you, you have to adjust the cheat see some end to whatever the card expects it wants the trailer is there or not. You may not even need to adjust the... You may not even need to really adjust the checksum end. One possibility would be to just take the checksum for the trailer and include that in your partial checksum and then it just cancels it out. Uh, that's exactly what we do. So, okay, so thank you, Boris. So next one is Florian. So we are low on time, so I will just skip to the numbers because that's the only thing that's actually relevant here. So what if we remove it, um, we will get around 30% performance hit for small packets, which is quite big. Um, if you test with bigger packets like 1,400, 1,500, then it will be roughly 10 to 12% performance hit. Um, the problem is that um, the flow cache can be brought into a state where it actually is really suboptimal and you can never get a hit and you always have to take the slow pass and in, that, in those cases, not having the flow cache is actually a big bonus and you can get up to 60 to 70 percent more performance if you have uh, bad traffic patterns that exploit um, flow cache behavior. Looking at um, um, perf top with the flow cache, um, you will see that the flow cache um, lookup is not actually very expensive, so it's pretty much down the line on with about one or two percent in perf. And um, if you uh, get rid of it, then um, suddenly you will have, have um, XFRM resolve and create bundle in the hot pass because um, normally that function will only be executed whenever you install a new flow into the cache, and suddenly that becomes a hot pass. Um, nowadays, after we got rid of the locks in the in that function and rely on RCU alone, it, we no longer have the problem that we run into scalability problems with several CPUs. But we do have the problem that um, the extra overhead of uh, just instantiating and deleting the additional DST uh, transformer entry is, is expensive. The atomic operations to get um, a reference on the policy and in the state uh, will become a problem. Um, the MTU in initialization grabs the spin lock and everything starts to show up. So I believe we can get a bit more performance out of this just by optimizing for that. Um, to my surprise, um, I do not believe that we have an algorithmic problem with um, uh, slow algorithms in the resolver function, so I do not believe that this will need major rework. So that's basically it, and I would defer to Hannes to um, do his stuff. Hi, um, I'm acting as a proxy here for Paul Wouters who gave me some points to raise um, in regards what he would like to see from um, the IPsec subsystem in the kernel. Um, Paul Wittes is the maintainer of Libreswan. 
Um, the most pressuring point he, he told me is that we, we might need to have um, ESP encapsulation inside TCP packets. So um, the RFC basically looks like that uh, the authentication process um, is done uh, with TLS, so that would be like normal TLS handshake in, in, the, in the beginning, which probably can, can maybe be done with, with KTLS or like in user space. And after that, we would have to pass the socket down to the XFRM layer where um, we would do the further data transmission, the ESP protocol inside the TCP connection. Um, it looks to me like it's a, we could actually reuse maybe TCP sockets, so we don't need to like, we don't end up in this STT mess. Um, I don't know if there's some possibility to like easily um, switch off conversion control behavior and let the inner TCP packets handle that. So to give everyone some context in case you missed the uh, abomination that just came through the microphone. <laughs> what STT is, is they try to use TCP as a transport layer. They tunnel traffic into uh, STT. Why do they do this? They think that it's a great idea because all hardware chips out there support checksumming offload and all these, and GRO and GSO and all these things. The problem is, TCP is not a datagram protocol, and middle boxes and shaping devices and all these things on, on the entire internet, for that for that matter, uh, expect TCP to behave in a certain way. And once you start using it as a transport layer, datagram based thing, all that goes out the window. For example, if an uh, intermediate router is uh, dropping packets with an algorithm like RED to try to uh, initiate back off of TCP flows, these STT streams do not back off. They keep sending at the maximum rate that they can get through the intermediate router. This is going to blow up every single piece of work that we've done with uh, Cubic High Start and now BBR and all these other congestion control algorithms. So anytime I hear someone using uh, TCP as a transport as a way to tunnel traffic, uh, I, I just I just don't like the idea in the first place. I am absolutely with you. The the point is that um, it's widely used, like all. SCT is detail. widely used. No, no, and we don't support it in the kernel. Yeah, that's why I rejected. It. I said no way. I know, no, but this IPsec stuff seems to be like coming up as this open connect, any connect from Cisco. Um, the question is like if, if they will do that in future in user space or not. Uh, on the other side, I basically think we can actually use a full-blown TCP socket, so we do conversion control on it, and just like, that's it, but we support from the kernel, and if they're not happy with that, they can do whatever they want. Would be my suggestion it not to you. So we do, I would simply do like normal TCP. The they sequence can, they can do the magic control. stuff in user space and send it over a normal TCP socket, and we could be none the wiser, and I would recommend that that's what they pursue if they absolutely, if they absolutely have to have the functionality, they can open TCP sockets in user space and just send. Yeah, that's actually the question. Like, if uh, would we allow, for example, we, we open it in user space and then we pass it on to XFRM to get like the correct routing behavior, or should we play tricks with tap and nut or stuff like that? So I'm with you. I, I would. I really want to hand this problem off to user space if they want to do stupid stuff like this over TCP sockets. I really don't want to support this as a first, as a first order facility inside the kernel. It really is bad. Uh, please, microphone. <laughs> Are they using STT or just full-blown TCP? I thought it was full-blown TCP. Because STT hacks the whole TCP state machine. It tries to make it stateless. It tries to... Yeah, it's just they, they, they use, so it's not like said what conversion control, what they provide, but basically what they say is like the beginning is a full-blown TCP handshake. After that, they do a full-blown TLS handshake. And then they switch to something which is the ESP and TCP mode. Yeah, but like STD fakes source port numbers so that it can get ECMP from the intermediate routers. Actually. Well, they don't care about that stuff. They say like connect to 443 or 4500 TCP and that's it. And they don't talk about that in the RFC. But I'm also just raising the, the discussion here, like if, if something like that would be abs absolutely not acceptable or what should be done about it. <clears throat> I, I think the premise is invalid. I, I, I think getting doing any of this, supporting any aspect of this in a kernel is really a non-starter. It would be like a user like iSCSI, I would suggest. So basically, we do connection setup and stuff and then hand it on in the kernel, and the kernel just does the written rights and conversion control would normally apply. So 
at least the router case you mentioned would be invalid because like it would back off if that would happen then at least but yeah that's I don't like it either it just like popped up uh, is, is there a problem that tap is so slow because it's terrible I mean, it's really 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 slow now I could imagine that basically implementing something like like a um, uh, uh, transport mode with routing and like I don't know how to get the packets easily to user space to to implement the IPsec model that we have so far. So it would be possible to like I mean you could probably get something running with like a pretty raw packet injection thing, but like I think that there's no easy solution to make that happen with Tapton because like how IPsec policies work and how you how you transfer them without actually doing routing. Out of tree OVS module. <laughs> No, you can't. You can't. So you we can, put it into OVS, okay? <laughs> can, can you just um, have an XFR, XFRM transform that has a template that sends it to a ton interface, and then you you take the you take the payload and you stuff it into TCP or something? It needs to be the other way around. I mean, like you, you need to create the routes then to a ton interface, and the ton interface and get associated to the XFRM, and then it would do the encapsulation. But where is the TCP then again? So. Once it's in user space, you send it on your TCP socket that's open. You, do, you read from a town file script and you write on a TCP socket. I, I would prefer to, to maybe we can talk later on this because like uh, I, we have some more points and we have like one minute left. Um, the second point is like um, host names in sockets or SKBs. So there's a request that basically um, opportunistic encryption should happen in the internet. So basically every connection to every other system should be encrypted. Um, and for that, that, the acquire messages, the callbacks from the kernel to user space that hit the Ike demons um, would need to actually have the domain names in them. So there was a request that there should be a set socket, for example, on sockets to set the host name. Um, I could also imagine to add, add a new connect, connect X call or something like that where we actually can do the put the host name to be resolved into the kernel, we have then the netlink messages which does the DNS resolving and at the same time the IPsec acquire and give that information back to actually do the resolving. Could be funny because like people could implement uh, other name resolution schemes like maybe one day support something like content addressable networks. I don't know, it came up, it, it is quite hurtful. I, I don't know why the kernel would need to do a DNS lookup because when you send the keying information to the daemon, it just could be another netlink attribute, and then the keying daemon does the DNS lookup and all the other stuff to do the, to resolve the. I wouldn't um, do the resolving in the kernel never, but we actually already have one DNS resolver in the kernel. It invokes a user ran program. Yeah, that's my proposal. Right, but but we need to but we need to have like this connection between like Firefox requests, whatever website dot com. Right. But I'm just saying, so it assume that there was a set sock option that stuck a string into the socket and then we try to do a send for the first time. So we have to resolve the transform and we send the message to the keying daemon. In exactly, that message yeah. to the keying daemon, we get an attribute that has the string in it that comes out of the socket. Exactly, that's, that's all we need. But it could be more difficult, like in case of unconnected uh, sockets, UDP sockets, we, we actually have to store that somehow per datagram if we want to support that. In the connected case, we can basically just refer to SKB, SK, and then get the string out of the socket in, in the unconnected case where it might be needed to do this VLC message. We you, have could, you could stick it into the, the transform entries or something like this. No, that doesn't work. Because you have to have a, a, a embryonic entry to talk in the first place anyway. So you always need some tra piece of transform state hang off the uh, packet in order to even figure out if you can resolve a, an IPsec path or not. So anything that's configured with the string would get these dummy transform entries that have the reference to the string, no matter what, if the SK is uh, connectionless or not. Mm, sorry, I couldn't follow. So I, I would, I would say uh, we have like a, a, an SPD entry which basically says like I want to encrypt everything, and then we basically have the I sitting on top of that, and then I open Firefox to some website, and then I need to have this this host name from the Firefox URL inside the Ike daemon, right. and that needs to go through the kernel somehow. And, and um, uh, the reason is we need this string, this host name, to look up the IPsec key in the DNS infrastructure. Doesn't it just uh, match on the security policy database? Yeah, but then you don't have the key for that. 
The, the issue is that the, the, policy, the policy covers all traffic that might be using the strings that the applications choose. But there's a many-to-one relationship. There's one policy, there's many strings. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So you can't just stick it into the single policy that covers everything. Exactly. But what I'm saying is you could instantiate dummy, dummy transform state objects that hang off the SKB that can track what we were trying to do. Hmm. Okay, maybe we chat later on. Yeah, okay. Just, just uh, so the next thing is probably interesting to the Android guys because, like, um, there was there's a request and that's kind of also very difficult for you, David. So we have this problem that uh, uh, shard two truncation, which is used in IPsec, is in the kernel with 96 uh, um, bit right now defined, and uh, basically the whole world and the RFC says we need to use 128 bit and that causes interoperability problems between Android because I think actually Android still uses the 96-bit and, and we should, that's because like uh, the ICK demons on, on Android don't upgrade the truncation to 128 over Netlink. Right, didn't so we it have, can be did, fixed. Didn't we have to add a new string into the transform tables? It's the, actually there, you can configure it already. Yeah, you Just can, like you can. No one, so we have like two worlds out there right now, like old buggy Cisco's, which have this problem, but basically everyone upgraded to 128 right now, and the question is like, should we maybe also like... Set the default to 128? Yes. Okay, uh, this, the patch was actually three times rejected. <laughs> So, so I can so me tell me how to fix it in user space. I just don't understand. I said you're so. in a second. Okay, thanks. Let <laughs> me fix it in user space. And okay, I gotta think about that a little bit more. Okay, so I can also send you like uh, uh, more. Send an RFC not, patch. Not send an RFC patch for the default change. But it's an RFC violation, right? The current behavior. Our kernel behaves. So the Linux kernel behaves like RFC, not like the RFC should. Uh, so in the RFC 128, default kernel 96. So we violate the RFC, so yes. it's a bug, except it's been around for a long time. Yes. But it is a bug. The whole world violates the ur urgent pointer location by one, so... <laughs> it's, yeah, that would be cool. Um, other questions are like, should we get like red limited acquires for bad IPsec SPIs? It would help in like uh, um, faster reestablishment of IPsec keys. Probably not a big issue, I think. Um, IPsec ESN display is zero. Is that a bug? Okay. <laughs> so I, I just got this information, like what I should talk about. Um, and then the next thing is also a little bit controversial. Um, so this uh, Ike, Ike version 2 can actually do tunnel mode negotiations and uh, not needs to be needs to sit in front of the um, XFRM manipulation so it can actually do the nutting inside the tunnel. It's I I <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah I don't know if someone had looked into that already. It looks like a little bit complicated. The problem is like that basically if you have one destination and you have two users behind NUT, they could have the same private IP address in, inside the NUT. And if they do the tunnel negotiation, they would talk to the same, uh, they would use the same inner tunnel IPs when talking to the same destination. So the destination could not actually use the IP address to know to which, which path to talk to. And that's why they, uh, so far as I understood the protocol, it's like a little bit difficult to understand the RFC even, is that they actually discover the outer IP address and then install a NUT rule to actually do destination not inside the tunnel with the discovered router IP address. <laughs> okay, I see no opinion on that. <laughs> hmm? No, I, no, I'm fine. So we are already five minutes over the time, so thanks everyone.